Welcome to the PV Reliability Performance Model webinar. Uh, my name is Janine Freeman. I lead the development of SAM here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And the majority of today's webinar is actually going to be given by my colleague Jeff Kleiss at Sandia, who is leading um, this project. Next slide. All right. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so before we go ahead and jump into the content, just a couple of administrative items. Uh, we are going to be recording this webinar, um, which will include the question and answer session at the end. Um, and then one, after we've recorded the webinar, we will post uh, the recording on the SAM website and on the model page on the SAM website as well. Um, so that you can send it to people you know who may have missed the live version. And while you're listening to the webinar, uh, you're welcome to ask questions via the questions box uh, in the GoToMeeting interface, which is highlighted here. Uh, we'll have a couple of us keeping an eye on questions. Uh, and as they come up, we can either type responses, save them for the Q&A session at the end, or uh, if it seems particularly relevant to what Jeff is talking about, I might interrupt him with the question. Um, you can also click the raise your hand button in the GoToMeeting interface. Um, and at the end, we can unmute phone lines so that you can ask your question live. So I think that's it on the logistics side. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Jeff to walk you through the whole model. Great. Thank you, Janine. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, taking the time to, to listen about this uh, feature that we've been adding in SAM. Uh, so here's a quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, you know, what is PVRPM? Uh, why would I use it? I think it's pretty simple. Um, we'll discuss that. Uh, how to set up a simulation. Um, we'll do kind of a, a live demonstration, and, and then I'll so show some slides from kind of a compiled um, set of runs uh, that it's just sort of like call it the tip of the iceberg of the type of analysis that you can do. And then I'll provide some uh, additional references uh, for you to, to look at if you more, have more interest in the model. Um, this project is funded by the uh, Solar Energy Technologies Office. Um, and we've been working on this together. Uh, Gina and myself for the past two years, and we're in the third year of this project. Uh, this year is more focused on uh, disseminating these results, getting feedback on the beta version, and um, publishing some papers, you know, looking at levelized cost of energy analysis, and uh, looking at actual real system failures and ways to look at how different maintenance strategies uh, impact uh, power, energy, and other, other interesting features when, when analyzing PV systems lifetime. And um, so uh, that's kind of where we're headed with this right now. Um, so let's jump into, uh, let's jump into kind of the, the what and the why. So PVRPM was originally developed by Sandia, um, through Josh Stein, Jennifer Ganata, and others in some of the reliability engineering departments as a way to, more as a proof of concept, to look at just faults and failures for modules and inverters. Um, you know, we, there's been a lot of work in performance modeling done to you know, come up with uncertainty in um, you know, weather and other inputs that you put into a, say, a 20, 25 year performance model. But there hadn't been any work done in well, what happens when components fail and how do I represent that um, or probabilistically uh, because we really don't know when they might fail, but we have it some degree of information. Uh, part of the challenge is obviously the industry is moving fast. There's a lot of new components and electronics that are coming into the market, and we just don't have a good sense of, you know, outside of our performance model, when these things fail and how we respond to them, what's that going to do to kind of our assumptions. So this helps give more insight into that um, by allowing you to run a PV performance model um, for, you know, hundreds, even thousands of realizations and get a more of a statistical uncertainty uh, that you can put on your on your results. The original version was done in GoldSim uh, as a player version, but it's very limited in, in the different types of configurations. So uh, we made a concerted effort to, to take the algorithm, uh, move it into 
uh, SAM, as SAM already has um, Sandia's Latin Hypercube sampling um, uh, code, that, so we could easily port that over and, and be able to you know, run SAM stochastically uh, to get similar results. And we have validated sort of our move of the models. Uh, there's a paper at the end that you can, um, I'll have a link for, and you can see what we looked at to sort of compare how well the models agreed between each other uh, to make sure we uh, implemented it correctly. So generally, you know, are you interested in how the failure of these components impacts power production, maintenance costs, and LCOE? Uh, these are the things that we can look at. We can look at modules, strings, combiners, disconnects, the inverter, the transformer. Uh, we can even look at trackers um, and how they fail and what that does to energy production and uh, also external grid impacts. So there's a lot of things that you can analyze either as a whole or as individual pieces. So say you're just interested in, in how the tracker might fail. So you can turn off all the other failure modes and just look at the tracker or look at the inverter. You know, look, you can look at all the different potential failure modes with the inverter and just analyze that by itself. Um, so there's a lot that you can do uh, with, with this uh, to answer the different questions that you might be looking to answer. So uh, let's, how do we set up a simulation? So some of you may have already done this, um, but here's the website for where you actually get the files to run this. Now this isn't a feature that's in SAM in its user interface, it's actually a feature that runs within the LK scripting language. And um, so if you you know, haven't worked in that scripting language before, I highly recommend you look at some of the other webinars in the SAM series um, and make sure that you become familiar with how that works so that you feel comfortable uh, running this. Um, but there's also a very good uh, data a user manual that's, that comes with this code. So when you download this, um, essentially you, you click on this zip file, make sure you actually extract the files, don't just open them, extract them to the location you want. Um, and so you'll get a folder over here on the right that says PVRPM beta. Um, and then when you open that folder, you'll see that there are five um, files associated with it. Um, two of them are LK scripts. Uh, one of them is an Excel file called confidence interval. The other is the beta instructions. And then there's the actual example that we're going to go through today. Um, now what I'm showing you on the very bottom here are the results. Um, it's, it's a folder I created after I extracted those files. And so when we do a simulation or a realization actually, um, all the results are going to go into this folder, and we'll show you how that's structured in the LK script. So before I jump into the actual um, demonstration, um, the default system parameters we have are listed here. Now, this table is in the user manual, so I just copied it out of there, but just wanted to show you we're going to go through kind of a very small system here. Um, it's only uh, four kilowatts, and we want to just be able to sort of show you what this actually can do. Um, but, you know, just for anybody that's interested in how this is all set up, um, here's all, all of our assumptions that we make uh, for our default uh, model. And um, real quick before I jump in, the layout of the default system sort of looks like this visually. So in the main SAM window, what we end up doing is setting up the number of modules, modules per string, strings in parallel, and number of inverters. Uh, when we get into the script, um, we actually add things that are not in the main SAM um, um, interface, which is number of uh, DT combiners, uh, number of transformers, if any, um, and then number of trackers, again, if any. And then the way we have a sort of a default right now is there's one AC disconnect uh, per inverter, and that's calculated automatically. Now it's important to note here that um, these layouts have to be pretty um, metrical, I guess, in the sense that um, you know we can't have portions of of uh, modules or combiners where you know I've got one string that might have an extra module here or um, you know, things like that. We, we need we, things need to be uh, pretty symmetric here to work properly. So if you have a very complex uh, commercial rooftop that has different inverter sizes and different modules per string. Um, you can't do that as one single model. You'd have to actually model those power blocks uh, separately. So 
So that is a limitation um, that's based on the fact that we're, this is a bottom-up model. Uh, this is how uh, we make it work right now. So I'm going to go into SAM. So it's important that um, when you run this that you actually um, essentially are running, um, running this through the most recent version of SAM. Um, and so I think you know, if you, you'll find out if you're not, but um, based on the release, I think the most there's a major release a while back that, that sort of allows you to run TVRPM. So make sure you're running um, the correct version of SAM uh, when you do this. So I'm going to uh, open a project file and um, go to sample small project. And like I showed in the uh, previous slides, um, here's your main SAM dashboard uh, where you can add you know, the inputs. I'm not going to go through too much detail other than I'll show a few little parts. Uh, it's important that when you do the system sizing, and this is the default in the, in the model, but you know, specify modules and inverters. So we need to actually specify the way this is laid out rather than just the default array size uh, because it's important that this passes through into the uh, LK script. And we're only looking at really is one subarray since we can't do multiple subarrays in the scripting language. It's just one, um, one subarray or one array. Um, as far as um, lifetime, it's important that we make sure that we're not doing this over one year, but over the analysis period. So we're running um, a simulation every single year um, for as many realizations as we do. And the module degradation rate right now just, we're not going to touch this, but there'll be something in the script that sort of overwrites this, this value here. Now, we also have this new daily losses uh, feature here, which uh, we're not going to enable this, but essentially this allows you to um, basically pass the values back and forth from the model. Um, since we're doing this stochastically, we're not going to put in some deterministic uh, losses. So uh, it's just sort of a thing that's exposed now that we can actually look at losses on the DC side um, from different failure modes. Um, battery storage is not something that we can model in any components of batteries at this point. Uh, that could be something in the future, but right now um, we're not looking at that. Um, financial parameters. So it's important that your analysis period is set here. Uh, for the default, we're looking at five years. Uh, so we will just leave that for now. Um, so if you're going to obviously change that to 20 or 25 years or commensurate with the, the lifetime of the PV system, and this is where you'd make that change. And um, not going to look at anything else um, on this dashboard at this point. So it's important that we get into the scripts because this is where we can actually change our distributions and, and set up the model in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to click open script. And there's two scripts here. There's a function script and the main script. Uh, the function script you don't need to open um, and don't need to change anything in there. Uh, that basically allows different features in the main script to run. So I, I highly suggest you know, not changing anything in that, otherwise um, uh, the, the script won't work. Now, if you're an advanced user and you want to you know, do some custom analysis, obviously you can get in there and, and you know, make changes. But, but we're just going to go through uh, the main script today and, and show you how to set up the model. So there's a lot of language in the beginning here just about copyright. Um, this is considered you know, open source, so you know, we're allowing people to obviously you know, look at it, see how it works, change it, um, use it in other software if you want. Just make sure you, you know, attribute um, Sandy and NREL uh, when, you, when you do that. So let's go in here kind of line by line and uh, take a look at what we need to do to set up the model. So, um, if you haven't looked at LK before, you need to understand that, you know, if you have these, these flashes here, that sort of a comments out um, anything. So, um, but again, if you need to get more detail on how to run something in LK, uh, please look at those webinars. Um, it's important here that we actually set up our results folder. So like I showed you before, I have an actual folder within this path called PVRPM results. So you need to define this here uh, because after you you know, run your model, this is where all the output files are going to go. Um, realization graphs, 
So if you're a SAM user, you know, there's many different graphs that you can have pop up after your simulation. Since you're going to maybe do, you know, 10, 50, or 100 realizations, uh, we don't want all those to pop up. So this is basically toggle to false uh, to keep that from happening. Uh, realization cases. Now, this is essentially, um, you have the ability within the SAM um, window to have multiple cases and tabs up here. So you might be familiar with that, right, where you create a separate model and, and within this, this one file. Um, so when you run this model, you can get up to 10 cases that show up here. Um, but essentially, we're going to be more interested in some of the output files. So, you know, some people might want to look at the difference between maybe two realizations. But in reality, um, we, we can't add 100 cases to this dashboard because it's, it's just going to create problems. So if you want to look at that, you can choose up to 10. Um, there'll be a base case that's added as well as the others. Um, but I highly recommend just, you know, not really focusing on that. But that is something that, that you can look at if you want. Uh, like I showed in that previous other slide, this is where you set up your number of combiners, uh, transformers, and trackers. And there'll be error modes that show up um, if, again, if you don't su submit things um, properly. Um, so make sure that you're, you've thought about your layout first in, in terms of, you know, how many trackers, I'm sorry, how many um, combiners and transformers are going to fit into your system. Um, and even if you don't look at trackers here, you can, you know, just leave this as two. We'll, we'll show you how that works later. Uh, there's financial inputs. So we can look at sort of the maintenance costs associated with uh, some of the way that we do the repairs. And at this point here, you can actually add some information about your labor rate and then inflation over time since you'll be running this for, you know, potentially 20, 25, or 30 years. Uh, tracker failure. There's a good description here in the user manual about what this is. Um, there's two cases. There's a, a sort of a, a worst case where the tracker fails at its rotation limits, um, either you know in the morning or in the evening, or um, at at stow. And so in this case, calling uh, worst case tracker false means that you're using sort of the better case where the tracker would face basically fail. Uh, face, with the modules facing straight up to the sky. So you'd actually get maybe more more diffuse horizontal irradiance on a day where it failed in that sense than if it failed at its rotation limit. I'm not going to get into the detail here about that, so please please look at the user manual and you can uh, get some more information uh, in that, how that works. Um, so let's jump over to the realizations to be run. So uh, you have to have at least two realizations and essentially in our case we've got a five-year simulation, and we're going to run it uh, three times. Um, uh, this is uh, exceedance probability value. You're probably used to this when looking at um, uh, SAM. I'm not going to get into this. I'm going to focus more on our confidence interval. So typically, if you're going to run something that's, um, if you say you want a 95% confidence interval, if you're sampling from a distribution, especially one that's not normal, um, you're going to want to run at least at least 100 realizations. and in order to be able to run a confidence interval of at least 95%, you're going to want, want to do 100. So in this case, we're just going to throw it in at 60 um, and then just do three realizations as an example. But, um, you know, look into that a little bit more if you're interested in, you know, some of the reasons why you'd, you'd want to have so many realizations, especially if you have non-normal distributions. And I just wanted to point that out. Um, now, based on the way that we're you know, calculating this, there's an Excel file that, that Sam needs to access. Make sure that you actually put the path in there um, and include the name of the file. And the file is already there. It's called confidence interval, but the path has to be in there so it can access it and, and do a different calculation outside of Sam. Um, so that, that's how we have it currently set up. Um, and, you know, if you have any questions about that later, we can talk offline. Um, so let's move into the more interesting part. So how do you actually set up uh, the distributions um, for, your, for, your, uh, for your model? So like I mentioned before, you can look at modules, strings, combiners, inverters, um, and so on. But this is where you really decide how you're going to model this. Um, and so what you can do here, if you want to actually uh, look at how these fail, like if I want to look at just modules, I would say, Yes, modules can fail, and then I'd go through all these other ones and then just set these to false. So then I'm just focusing on modules. 
in our test case here, we're going to keep them all on um, so we can see the results of the outputs. Um, and then repair. There's a repair mode that's associated with that. You can actually turn off the repair mode so that you know the component can only fail and it's not repaired during during the entire you know, simulation period. Um, so you can toggle that true or false here. Uh, we've also added the ability to look at warranties. Now, um, what the warranty does is essentially creates a time so that if there's a failure up to that point, uh, any labor associated with repairing that is not counted. And then after that period, then the labor is um, counted. Uh, we don't have an input for the actual component cost um, that could be, you know, worked in on the same main SAM dashboard and other costs. But um, this sort of just gives you a sense of, of you know, some of the labor functions that, that you might incur uh, based on different scenarios on how you might decide to repair or, you know, wait for another six months. So, you, so it gives you some, some interesting cost metrics you can roll up uh, at the end. And then one nice thing about this is you can look at one failure or you can look at multiple failure modes. In this example, we're just, you know, the, these examples don't necessarily represent real distributions, just examples, but uh, in this case we have two different failure modes and then we have one repair mode. Um, now, basically, the zero here uh, represents the zero and the one, and if you were to keep adding this on two, three, four, you could have, you know, 50 failure modes if you wanted, um, and then you could have just one repair mode based on that, or you could match, you know, one for one, the failure mode with the repair mode. Um, I'd say maybe in the inverter space, that's probably what people like to do. Some inverter failures would be, you know, automatically reset or, or reset remotely. Other ones you might have to send a tech out for right away. Other ones you might want to wait for, you know, a couple weeks. So you can sort of define how you want to respond to that um, probabilistically uh, with these different ways of mixing and matching uh, failure and repair modes. And then you can look at degradation here. For our example, I have this 20% per year uh, degradation. We're just doing this as an accelerated example, just to sort of show behavior. Um, you know, in reality, you'd set something more realistic, like a half percent per year. Um, so, um, so you can actually uh, change that here as well. And the way these distributions work is you actually pick the type of distribution, and I'll go to another slide to show you what types we have. Um, these are the distributions that are already available in SAM. Uh, so some of you may might have used some of these features for other other analyses, um, but these are sort of the parameters that go along with each distribution and a little description about them. In the user manual, if you have questions about why you would use a certain distribution, we have a whole appendix that goes into, you know, why I would want to use an exponential over a Weibull um, based on the type of failure mode. So some of that, you know, if you're in, if you're running systems and you're, or you know a little bit about reliability or electronics, you might understand, you know, things fail a certain way, they follow a certain distribution. Um, there's some projects that I'm working on with NREL in, in a different area that's actually publishing uh, different types of failure modes for um, inverters and other components. So we'll be publishing other information later that you could use to run models or sort of compare against. Um, your own data, um, and so you can actually take your own failure data and come up with your own distribution. So I'm not going to get into that in too much detail now. Um, we can talk about that later, but I'm just going to try to show you how we can set these up uh, using this types of, these types of data. So let's get back into here. So we've kind of gone over everything. I guess let me go real, real quick. So in this case, we have a normal distribution, and it's important that that you know in SAM we're doing these things daily. So when you characterize your failure distributions, you want to make sure that your your raw data you're looking at is in days. Um, you can't just you know do something in hours and convert it to days later. It just it just won't work properly. So so make sure when you're characterizing your data and actually developing either time to failure or time to repair estimates uh, to develop distributions, you know make sure that that you're using days initially. Um, and then it'll work, work properly. So we have uh, strings here, and again, we're just using different distributions to kind of show you examples of how this will work. Um, combiners, uh, in these cases, we're only doing you know one failure and one repair distribution. Uh, inverters, there's a little bit more detail here. So we've got 
um, three different uh, repair uh, failure modes, and then we also have three different repair distributions. So we, each one sort of matches the other, uh, depending on how fast or how slow we want to repair that. Uh, I'm not going to get into this cost piece, um, but there's a different way. You know, you can look at costs uh, based on inverter size. So um, again, look at the user manual for for more descriptions there. Um, AC disconnect uh, transformer. Um, and in grid, and so in the grid area, you can actually model how things that happen in the grid prevent you from, um, um, you know, exporting energy. And so if you have a good sense of you're having a lot of recloser issues or, you know, there's lightning events impacting the distribution, you know, system somewhere and it keeps, you know, the grid keeps shutting you down, you can actually take that data and, you know, do a triangular distribution or a Poisson or something like that. And, and sort of represent sort of those types of effects um, in the grid area. Um, you can even, you know, take different general environmental effects um, like lightning and, you know, attribute that to like inverters. Um, so there, there are other, other types of ways, failure modes that you can use to, depending on what you're affecting, if you're affecting the entire grid or if you're affecting, you know, just the modules or just the inverters. Um, trackers. So. We're not doing a tracker simulation here. Um, we're just doing fixed tilt, but I wanted to show you there's a couple ways to comment things out. In this case, uh, we've used the comment feature to bracket this, these lines of code. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that. You can just say can fail uh, false, and that'll also turn off the tracker mode. So there's a couple, couple different ways you can work within here to comment things out. Um, if you're not familiar with working with LK, I would just suggest using uh, the toggles here for can fail and can repair as a way to just uh, turn that section off. Um, so I've gone through pretty much all of the stuff before we actually run it. Uh, I don't know if there's any quick questions people have before we actually do do a quick run. I'm not seeing any typed in just yet. Okay. Good. That's fine. All right. So, so the way you actually run this is you don't run it within the, the main SAM window. You actually run it from the script. And so once you have your all your inputs ready to go, um, you click the run button. And what it's going to do, you'll see it's going to actually create these cases. So it created a base case, just called entitled here. And then you're going to have each realization case is going to show up here um, on the top. Now, what's happening down here on the left, bottom left of the LK script, is it's kind of summarizing some of the failures that you're seeing um, and some of the costs. And a lot of that's going to be shown in the output files as well, but it just gives you kind of a visual representation of um, over you know, five years and with three realizations. Here's a summary of the cost, and you know this is laid out basically by the component types. But um, it's, it's more useful to look at this in the CSV file, so we'll we'll just jump into that at this point. But you can see at a high level, you know, here's what's going on per realization. Um, let's get into the CSV file. So um, since I pre-created that results folder, I'm going to open that up, and you can see here there's five files that that come out per realization. Now it's a, I'm sorry per simulation. Now it's important to know that if you're going to run this again, it's going to overwrite these CSV files. So you need to either rename them or copy them and paste them somewhere else if you want to keep those results um, between simulations. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is open the summary results. A CSV file, and we'll kind of go through go through that and show you um, what's in there. I'm going to expand the headers just so you can see them. So, so what we have here is um, we have a base case here, which is basically your just your general SAM run um, with no failures. And so that's why you're seeing these null values here because we're really trying to count up failures um, in energy production. Uh, which will have values further on down here. And then each realization is going to show up as a new row. So 
So if I had 100 realizations, then it would basically populate um, 100 rows through here. And then it would basically, all my summary statistics are going to occur under that. Um, the summary statistics we have include the min, max, mean, median, uh, the standard deviation of the mean. And then this is our confidence interval that we chose around the mean, and then our exceedance probability uh, value. And what we've included here, um, we've got our LCOE. Uh, we also have our module failures. Um, remember when we set that up, there were two different module failures. And so we can actually um, look at that by that, that type of failure, and then it also rolls it up into a total. Um, we've also included a mean time between failure, but I would just caution you about you know, using that. Um, you have to understand if you know you're not in a constant failure rate scenario, that a mean time between failure might not not really mean anything. Um, and so, you know, if, if you really say if you're understanding reliability statistics and you're in that sort of bathtub bathtub part of the curve where you know you have constant failure modes where things aren't defective and aren't you know nearing the end of their lifetime, then this might be a useful metric. Um, but if you're not in that phase and you don't really know, um, I just, you know, highly recommend about not using that. Um, but, you know, please do some research into that to get an understanding of some of the um, assumptions and of, of how to interpret that properly. Uh, we also have an availability metric here for that specific um, component. So that's just the modules um, that we're looking at for the availability. That's a time-based availability. And then we also, we can move on to string. In this case, we only have string total failures because we didn't define multiple string failure modes. If we did, we'd see this, you know, failure type 0, 1, 2, through n, depending on how many failure modes we wanted to look at. Um, moving over, we've got combiners um, and then inverter. Remember, we had three different inverter uh, failure modes. And then um, we also, that's also sum, summed up to here as well. And then inverter availability. Now, inverter availability is sort of something that's a common metric that people see, um, and availability guarantees or performance guarantees. And um, so this, this is sort of a number that a lot of people are interested in because it gives you a sense of that, that uptime. But the nice thing about this is we can look at that same metric on different levels of components. Uh, and we have our, our disconnect, transformer, and grid. And then we have some energy metrics. So we have, so this is our base run here, and then this is, these are our three uh, realizations. And this is year one, because we did a five-year simulation all the way through year five. And then we have a cumulative value, which basically is, you know, a cumulative value up through year five of these values here on the left. And then at the far end, we have um, some DC energy values. So you can sort of see based on module, string, and combiner failures um, what's happening up to the point of the inverter uh, in terms of your energy production and then potential losses if you compare that to your base case. Um, so that's, that's what you would get in the summary results file. Let's move on to um, yearly cost by component. So in this file, um, per realization, you'll get each year's worth of cost. Now remember in the module, we had um, a 20 year warranty. So any of the failures that happen to the modules, um, you know, the, if we decided to replace them, uh, we didn't incur a cost. Now, you know, in reality, sometimes you just, you know, leave the module there even if you knew it was failed. So um, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to analyze this if you're not interested in you know, the warranty aspect, obviously you could turn that off and just look at how much it might cost one person to go out and replace that if you knew it was broken. So, um, but that, this is just the result of this scenario. And then in grid, again, we didn't have any costs associated with that, maybe because we were assuming that the utility is going to take care of any recloser issues. Um, so, um, so that's, that's, that's the way that looks. But you can see here, you know, there was probably there more failures, um, you know, in, in, year three than there were in year two. And you can see basically the costs of replacing those based on your repair distribution. And so you can sort of compare those per realization. Now, what we don't have in this cost file are 
all these values rolled up uh, to uh, um, you know a mean, min, man, min, max, or median um, standard deviation. So that's something we could probably add at some point, but right now it's just going to show per realization uh, what these costs are. So that's another useful thing if you want to look at it that way. Um, another useful thing we can look at is the time series AC and DC power. So these are on an hourly basis and per realization for the entire five years. So you can take that, you can plot that in DView, or you can um, take a look somewhere else uh, at that information. And then also of interest is uh, actual daily degradation rate. And I'm going to show an example after this simulation of kind of what you can do um, looking at uh, the degradation um, between different realizations and assumptions. Um, so these are the main output files uh, that that um, PBRPM will give you uh, that you can post-process and, and analyze uh, elsewhere. Um, and I guess I failed to uh, show these earlier, but since I'm here now, I'll just explain a little bit more about the distributions. And so in this case with the, mo the, the modules, um, that was a normal distribution, and here's the parameters in days. And you can see, you know, if you plot this, what it looks like. Um, in the user manual, in the appendix, there's a nice description about if you vary certain parameters, what that does to the shape. Um, so you, if you want to play with different failure modes and repair modes, if you want to make it fail early or if it's a failure that's only going to occur early on and maybe not later, you can pick that type of distribution, put it in the SAM, test it out, see what it does um, to your system. And another example here is a Weibel that we used in, in the grid example. Weibels are pretty um, useful because they can approximate other types of distributions as well. So they're kind of the most flexible distribution you can use. And in this case, um, we have the way we set this up is that the failure is going to occur. It would only occur, you know, very early in the lifetime and then less, less of a probability over time of that failure occurring. And you can sort of see here on the bottom left, when you vary the shape and scale parameters, uh, kind of what that looks like um, to set up your simulation and how you want to sample from that distribution. Um, so, so those are some examples there. I uh, went through the demonstration. So analyzing results. So there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, you know, one thing I thought that would be interesting is to, to focus on maybe what happens to degradation rates um, when you start replacing modules. So what I did here is I, you know, we use that accelerated 20% in degradation rate, which is obviously unrealistic. But the, the point here is just to sort of look at behavior and see what you can, what you can, you know, glean from that. Uh, I did 100 realizations over the same five-year time period, and what I did is I plotted all the realizations just in Excel really quickly, and then I actually calculated the um, um, the mean of those, as well as the 95% confidence interval, which is represented by these dashes. And um, this is, these are 24 modules in the system. And you know, there's two different types of um, failure distributions, a normal and an exponential. But what's um, important here is what I'm doing is I'm actually varying the repair distribution. So my repair distribution, I had a mean of 60 days and standard deviation of 20. Um, what I've done here is I've changed it so that, well, I'm actually going to wait, you know, more on average 20, 200 days to repair the modules instead of 20. Um, and, you know, what, what can that tell me about um, the degradation of the modules? And the idea is, is if you have a lot of modules that fail and you replace those, that's actually going to change the degradation rate for your entire system because you've introduced brand new modules that are going to degrade at different rates. Um, so there's a lot that you can sort of study in this area about, you know, what, does it even make sense to replace the modules because I'm still under, you know, certain financial constraints or I have enough to work with um, so I don't need to replace them right away. Um, so the next plot I'm going to show here is uh, the actual mean. So these two um, solid lines for each, um, each uh, simulation. This is the mean value. So the one on the top is the more frequent replacement, 
and the resulting degradation rate. The one on the bottom is the less frequent. And you can see the less frequent one actually dips and then it kind of increases and it kind of catches up to the more frequent. So what's happening is when you're replacing it less frequently, um, your degradation rate is obviously going to be a little bit more. Uh, but when you start replacing those modules more frequently, you're going to have a higher you know, bulk degradation rate to work with. And just some of the summary statistics, um, you know, the mean and the more frequent, you had 48 module failures, and then less frequent, you ended up having 57 module failures. And you had a, a lower availability, obviously because these were left in a failed state longer than if they were replaced more frequently. Um, but there's a lot of different behaviors you can study in this. This is only looking at five years, not 25 years. You could you know, extend this out under lots of different replacement um, scenarios. Uh, so we have a variety of uh, references to look at. Uh, the user manual, like I sh mentioned before, is available within the download file. So I suggest you know taking a look at that, going through it step by step, um, and then looking at the appendices to understand how to actually what the failure modes do, and then how to take your own data. We have a small example of how to take your own failure data from your own systems and develop. Um, uh, failure and repair distributions from that. Um, we did a validation report this year that essentially looked at you know how well does this uh, predict failures using system, real system data that I have access to right now. Um, some of that data will be published as a result of part of a, a collaboration with NREL on a different project. Um, so I look forward to that. And then in the past we've published a few other papers about proof of concept and here's a, a few links that you can look at that'll talk about you know some of the we did some with different maintenance scenarios um, and then some with uh, different system configurations and looked at you know cumulative uh, costs and you know different you know energy impacts based on if you wait longer to repair something or repair it earlier so uh, that's that's out there for you to read and reference as well uh, thank you for your time, and please feel free to reach out to myself or Janine um, if you have any questions about using this. Um, you know, we do have some other efforts afoot right now to um, improve the processing time. Right now, we showed you a very small PV system size. It runs pretty quick. Uh, if you want to start looking at you know, systems in the you know, one megawatt range, it definitely takes longer because it's looking at every component in the system. Um, but NREL is working on ways to use, obviously, all the processors in your computer uh, to speed up that, that process for analyzing it. So um, I guess I will stop with that, and we can ask any questions or answer any questions. And I guess, Janine, if there's any additional clarifications you want, uh, please feel free. Great. Thanks, Jeff. That was a really good overview. Um, just as a reminder to folks who are listening, if uh, you want to ask questions, you can type them in the questions window, or you could also raise your hand in the GoToWebinar interface, uh, and we can call on you. Um, so while we're waiting for additional questions to roll in, uh, maybe I'll start with a couple of things um, over here. Uh, one question is how to get the input distributions for the um, LK scripts? Um, so the ones that we're using in this example um, are ones that we've used from sort of past examples in PVRPM. So they're kind of dummy, uh, dummy distributions. Um, but we are, like I mentioned before, in the process of publishing um, actual distributions from real systems in the U.S. Um, and a lot of that's on power electronics, uh, inverters, and other components. But we do have some on trackers and uh, a little bit on modules as well. So I don't have that to share with you right away, um, but we will have that to share um, pretty soon within this month. Um, so you can see sort of what types of distributions we develop for different system sizes. Um, and go from there. But you know, one thing you can do is just basically play around with uh, the, the different distribution types and you know make some assumptions about you know module failures if you if you think they're going to fail after 
15 years, you know, look at these different distributions and come up with a mean that sort of matches that, and then an intensity um, for your standard deviation, and then um, you know, see if that matches uh, what you're seeing with your own system. And again, the end of the appendix goes into detail about how you would take your own failure data, right, the time it fails and then the time you've created it in relation to the time that it's been commissioned um, so you can come up with your own um, repair distributions. Great. Um, another question is, uh, is there any type of limit on system size that can be run? Uh, like, for instance, could you use it for utility scale systems, or is it more suited for smaller systems? Um, you could use it for, you know, up to utility scale. I mean, I was looking at 5 and 10 megawatt systems um, doing some of the validation. Um, it, it would take a little while um, to, to run these, and so, you know, we're like I mentioned before, working on the parallelization to, to speed that up. But if you have time to let it run, um, it can it can do large systems as well. I mean, we haven't tried it on anything over, you know, 20 megawatts or 50 megawatts at this point. Uh, we do have ideas in the future about how to um, sort of, um, you know, look at look at this a little differently instead of a bottom-up model. Ways that we can um, group failures and speed up the simulation for really large systems. So that's a future area of research we'd like to pursue. But at this point, you can still run a large model. It's just going to take a lot longer. And just to tack on to that with um, the parallelization efforts, uh, one of our developers on the SAM team, Steve, is doing a really great job of enabling that in LK scripting uh, and some initial tests uh, on a eight logical core machine showed about a five-fold increase in speed, uh, which is pretty typical for um, parallelization because there is a little bit of overhead in uh, running the parallel processes. So uh, we're pretty excited for that capability to get tested and go out uh, in a future version as well. And yeah, we'll, we'll be able to add some benchmarking times to the next version of the user manual to give people an idea of what they can expect if you have a, a certain type of computer. So, um, There's one question on uh, sort of looking at the typical bathtub curve for failures, uh, how you might go about representing that in PVRPM. Yeah, so um, can do here is actually I'll go back to the script. So um, so say here for inverters, you know we've got three different failure modes, and you can actually take um, you know these are just labels where we have you know routine component or catastrophic. You can put whatever you want there, um, but what you would do is you know you would take um, your first distribution, and you could use one like the Weibull or an exponential where you've got the failure actually occurring pretty early on. Um, and if it doesn't happen early, it's not going to happen. You know, the probability is going to decrease. That would sort of be the left side of your bathtub curve. Um, and then your next failure mode would be something that represents a more of a, a constant failure rate, um, which you could represent through um, uh, either an exponential or log normal. Um, failure rate. Um, so that's you could you could define your constant failure rate mode there, and then your um, you know your your late stage or the right side of the bathtub curve that could be your your third failure mode, and then you'd come up with a, a distribution that's more you know right skewed so that you know it's not going to happen early on at all, but it definitely represents a wear out event where you're getting close to the end of that component's lifetime, and the probabilities start start increasing. And so by putting all three of those in into here, um, then then you sort of develop that that bathtub curve where they essentially overlap. Um, and so as it runs through it, it'll probably ignore the third and the second one because the probabilities are a lot lower. But then potentially sample from the first one if you think that you've got 
you know, a, a, a component that maybe hasn't been tested very well in the field and, you know, it's brand new from the manufacturer. And so there's a good chance that you're going to be, you know, the guinea pig uh, out there testing it. Um, you know, we've heard that from certain types of components on PV systems that that happens frequently. Um, so you'll, you could model that. And then as time goes on, you're going to end up getting more failures sampled from that middle distribution that you've created. Uh, based on how that's set up, the probabilities increase more in the middle of the lifetime. And then as you get closer to, you know, 20 or 25 years, probabilities are higher, you're going to start sampling from the third distribution. So that's how you would sort of represent those pieces of the bathtub curve. Awesome. Um, we also had a question in the room uh, if we have any ideas on uh, maybe some example use cases or people we've talked to, um, what types of questions they're using this model to answer or interested in using the model to answer. Yeah, so um, you want to talk about one of them, Janine? Sure. Um, so we've talked with a, um, a tracker manufacturer who is looking at using this model to <coughs> Um, sort of compare different types of tracking technologies. So if you have uh, one tracker that drives a lot more PV modules um, so that when it fails, it's taking out a bigger portion of the system, but they, you know, focus more on the reliability so it doesn't fail as often versus several different trackers that might fail more often but don't take out as much of the system when they do fail. Um, they've started using this model to look at uh, that type of comparison uh, on a cost basis, which has been sort of interesting. Um, and then we had also talked to someone at a university. I don't know if you maybe have more details on that one, Jeff, who is looking at a really large system, something on the order of 50 megawatts, uh, and sort of stressing the reliability cases with that model. Yeah, they're, they're very interested in the module uh, reliability. so going through a lot of different module failure modes um, and seeing if they can match um, things that they're seeing in the field. So, um, so that's one other use case that we know about right now. And you know, we're going to be publishing uh, a few papers that will go into some different example use cases on, you know, looking at real systems that we have um, and also, you know, doing other types of analysis to ways to sort of look at costs. Um, and maybe come up with um, multiple scenarios on, you know, if you don't know much about your system, but how would you take some of the reliability data we have and try to match it to, you know, what you have. So it give you some more um, steps on if you're trying to figure out how to make sense out of your data. Um, what do I do with it? How do I pull out this operational data? And how do I, you know, get something of use so that I can help, you know, make better predictions? So. So we, we hope to do that this year as well. Uh, great. Um, we're sort of winding down on the questions, so we'll maybe give people another minute to ask any last minute things that are burning in their heads there. Um, and I don't know. Jeff, if there are any future plans, uh, I know you mentioned sort of throughout some of the things we're planning to do with it, um, but any ideas or anything that we welcome feedback on? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it'd be great if those that have listened today could, you know, go through it, um, play with it, and see if there's additional output metrics that, you know, might be of interest to you. Um, you know, we've sort of taken our, our look at it based on what was done in the proof of concept, but um, there are many ways to sort of analyze the, the re resulting reliability or other, other impacts to the system. And if you feel that there's something um, impactful that we could put in the SAM or, you know, Im improve the way it's being structured, um, we're definitely open to those suggestions. All right. Um, looks like 
we don't have any further questions. So thank you, Jeff, for going through so many of the details in this model. It's certainly complex, um, but in my opinion, that's what makes it the most useful and flexible to answer a lot of questions is all of those different knobs that you can turn. Um, and thanks to everyone who's uh, attended and listened and uh, we'll look forward to hearing any feedback you might have and uh, especially if you do use the model, even if you just want to shoot us a quick note on how you're using it if you don't have questions. Um, we'd love to hear that too just to get a better insight onto what the industry is doing with it. And also, if you want to, you know, receive a copy of the distributions that we're creating as part of this other project, then please email me, and then I can make sure that you're aware right away once we get that published. So I know that's always the biggest part of this is, you know, where do we get the distributions? Um, how can we, you know, make sense out of that part of it? So please let me know if you want to be the first to know about those. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Jeff, and we will look forward to hearing from you all. And feel free to share the posting of the recording uh, with people you know who might be interested. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye.